Good morning and welcome to Park Community Church. If you've been in the military, I know that you're familiar with the phrase, hurry up and wait. Because that's what you do in the military. They hurry you to a particular place or to something that they want you to do. And then while everybody's there, you just wait. You just wait and they, until they actually tell you to do what it is that they want you to do. There's a lot of waiting in the military. The title of my message this morning is Wait on the Lord. And I'd like to begin with an incident that occurred about a week ago. And I pulled an article off the internet that I'd like to read to you. Mark Lawrence, the owner of the Polar Cave Ice Cream Parlor on Cape Cod, had originally shared the shocking story on Saturday, just one day after the shop reopened to the public under the state's coronavirus guidelines. That day, the shop was overwhelmed with customers, some of whom became agitated that their orders were taking too long. But instead of waiting patiently, Lawrence said customers began spewing vulgar and hateful words toward one of his employees. She was met with an unyielding verbal assault with some of the most vulgar and disgusting wor words hurled at her, he said. There shouldn't, these shouldn't be heard in a men's locker room, never mind directed to a teenager. The girl, just 17, then quit at the end of her shift. She had worked at the shop for three years. In the past 19 years of operation, this is the lowest feeling I've ever felt, Lawrence wrote in a Facebook post on Friday after the shop had closed. He says, regardless of people's frustrations, to take it out on a teenage girl is simply wrong. It cost one of my best employees due to the rudeness directed at her tonight. So wrong in so many ways to treat a teenager with such disrespect, no matter what the circumstances. You know, I always share with you that inconvenience it's just a normal part of, of life on planet Earth. We, we will always be inconvenienced. Uh, think about it. Think about it. A man enters a convenience store to get a quick cup of coffee on his way to work, only to find out that the dark roast pot is empty. And the clerk says, well, if you have 10 minutes, I'll brew another. If he had 10 minutes, he wouldn't have gone into a convenience store. He would have brewed his own dark roast at home before he left. But again, inconvenience is just a normal part of life. And sometimes when it happens, you know, even to me, I'll admit, I go, why me? Why me, Lord? Well, why not me? What makes me special? What makes me think that I shouldn't be inconvenienced or I'm so important that I can't be interrupted? I mean, even God's people are inconvenienced. Recently, I was reading in John chapter 11, and I was reading about the story of Lazarus. And I read that when Jesus finally arrived there after three days, Martha ran out to meet him. And the first words she said to the Savior were, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then you read down a little farther, and Mary finally gets a chance to greet Jesus. And she says the exact same words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, it's indicative in the words that they chose to speak to Jesus that they, they didn't like the wait. They didn't like the fact that they had to wait on him three days. And that in the meantime, his brother died. But Jesus had a plan, and if you've read that story, you know his plan was to reveal his glory by raising Lazarus for all the people present to see. But my point in this was they didn't like waiting, and none of us like waiting. None of us like being inconvenienced. I mean, let's be honest. Hey, but Moses was inconvenienced. Here he led this, this band of, of rebels, this large nation of Israel, 
throughout the desert all of those days and actually for years. And he was told to assemble them before a rock and God would provide water out of this rock. And his frustration came out in that instead of obeying the Lord, he took his rod and smacked the rock two times. And then the water came out. Well, there were consequences to his actions. God told him that he would be able to see, but he would not enter the promised land because of his disobedience. So there are always consequences. Abraham was inconvenienced. He and his wife were promised by God a son, and they got tired of waiting. So Abraham fathered a son with Hagar, one of his wife's maidens. And there's been problems in Israel to this day as a result of their behavior when they were inconvenienced. King Saul was inconvenienced. He was out there fighting the Philistines and about to go into battle. And Samuel said, I'll be there before you go into battle to bless you and to assist you in offering sacrifices. And Saul got tired of waiting for him. Again, he got tired of the wait. So what did he do? He stepped into the place of a priest and began to offer sacrifices. And as soon as he did, Samuel showed up. And Samuel was disappointed, very disappointed, because Saul was not a priest. And only priests offer sacrifices to God. And so what was the consequence for Saul? Well, immediately, Samuel began to look for the next king. And we know that he found David and anointed him as the next king of Israel. The Bible also makes a very st sad statement that has always grieved me and has always concerned me in my ministry before the Lord. It says that the spirit was lifted from Saul. And he didn't even know it. God took his spirit off of Saul, and he never was the same champion, the same leader, or the same man ever again. Because he was inconvenienced. He didn't like to wait. Joseph was inconvenienced. I mean, boy, howdy, he was inconvenienced. He went to serve his brother's lunch, and they threw him in a hole. And then he was carried off Kathy to Egypt. And once he got there, he was lied about and thrown into prison. But eventually, he got out of prison and was actually elevated to second in command of the entire nation of Egypt. So when his brothers finally came down because of a famine to get grain, and he revealed himself to his brothers, he told them what you intended for evil, God actually used for good, raised me up to second in command in Egypt, and he saved the nation of Israel from a famine by the action of Joseph's brothers. But who would have thought? Who would have thought? Many are inconvenienced today. We're right smack dab in the middle of a pandemic. And we're all wondering, when's it going to end? When are we going to be free to go about what is normal life? And you know, it, it, it's hard to wait in this situation. I talk to members of my church. I talk to other pastors. We wonder, when are we going to fr be free to come back together? But then, you know, I sit down and I, and I catch my thoughts and I began to realize that God wasn't caught off guard by this pandemic. He knew in years past that it was going to happen. Didn't take him by surprise. And I believe it will end according to his plan and his timing. It won't end any other way. He could end it today if he wanted to, but apparently that's not his plan. And so now everybody's talking about the, the new normal and wondering, well, what that might be. Well, I'm here to say the new normal might actually be good. It might be that God uses this pandemic for good, and on the other side of it, we arrive at something better. I don't know, but I know that he does. What saddens me, though, is there is at the present time a, a movement uh, among pastors. It started in Southern California, but now 
is gaining momentum in other parts of the United States where pastors are coming together and they're forming a pact to actually disobey civil government and to open their churches on the 31st of May. And I'm concerned about that. I'd like to read you a portion of scripture found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedoms as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. I want to emphasize that one line where Peter charges us not to use our freedoms as a cover-up for evil. I'll be the first to say yes, that as American citizens, we are afforded certain freedoms under the Constitution. The founding fathers of this country wrote it in such a way that we were given certain rights and privileges that could not be taken away. But it says, don't use those freedoms as a cover-up for evil. If we take those freedoms and make them more important than the commandments of the Lord, then we're actually committing evil. And we shouldn't do that. You see, the freedoms provided us are, are provided by the Constitution. But they're not on par with God's commandments. God's commandments are far superior than the freedoms that are ours built into our Constitution. Civil freedoms have to take, uh, have to rank below, I'm sorry, I couldn't think of the word, but civil freedoms rank below God's commandments. It's God's com commandments that we are to obey. And that's why Peter wrote, don't use your freedoms as cover-ups for evil. You know, we could justify opening on the 31st. By golly, it is our right. We've been given a right. And, and some people will say, well, yeah. And the, and the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. But that's not a commandment of God. God didn't say, I want you to worship me on the Sabbath every week. That would be a commandment. But what we find in the Bible is an injunction, which is not a commandment, the injunction, kind of like a, a, a hard encouragement, says, don't give up meeting together. So that's not a commandment. We can't step out and go, well, the Bible commands us to, to assemble, so we're going to disobey the governor and, and do that. No. The commandment is, obey the civil authorities and those that God has placed over you. Obey them, and that will be a witness to everyone else around you. So, I don't know what's going to happen when these pastors open their churches. I'm not going to judge them. It's not my role to judge them. But I am going to sit and watch with curiosity as to what happens. See, the people I pastor in this church tend to be elderly. We have a predominantly elderly congregation. And I think I would be foolish if I brought those people together in a gathering and subject, subjected them to the possibility of contracting this virus. Maybe from someone who doesn't even know that they have it. But I have a grave responsibility to ensure their safety and to look out for their welfare. And it would be wrong for me to bring them together until I really believe that God has said it's okay to bring them together. I don't know what it would be like for me. If I opened our church on May 31st, we started meeting together and having a good time, and I guarantee you, it would be a good time. 
But if a week, 10 days, two weeks after that, one of our precious parishioners died as a result of something they've contracted while attending church, I would feel terrible. I would really feel terrible. I don't want that to happen. And pastor, I don't think you want that to happen either. So I really encourage you to quiet yourself before the Lord and really pray about whether or not you should defy civil authority and open your church early and let the Spirit of the Lord lead you. Let me move on. So in considering this message about waiting on God, I, I had to ask myself, what do I do when I experience one of these normal life inconveniences? And I call them normal life because that's what they are. They're not something out of the norm. They're not something unusual. They're a daily occurrence. And so what do I do when I experience that? Do I react or do I respond? So I began to consider some scenarios in my mind. I thought about uh, me at Walmart, where I've been many times, with a cart full of stuff, and I'm tired from walking around that store. And so I go to the checkout line, and there's four people in front of me with loaded baskets, and the person that is at the cashier right now can't get their credit card to work. And so they've been trying four or five times to get their credit card to work, and I'm standing in the back of the line. And how am I reacting to that? What's, what is going on inside of me? I wanted to consider that. Or, hey, I'm tired from a hard day's work here at the church, you know, and I'm, I'm driving my 20 miles back home, and I get stuck behind a real slow driver. You know, this person's just poking along like they're looking for an address or something. And I can't get around them. There's no way to pass them. Do I react or do I respond? You see, it, it, it all depends on me. Well, I think I'd have to admit that sometimes I would react, but I would catch myself and do what I'm going to share with you in just a minute. But I am prone to react, and that is not good. Because here's what happens. When you react to an inconvenience, you start down a slippery slope that just keeps spiraling downwards. My, my first reaction is I, I, I feel my, my flesh begins to rise up. You know that as a Christian, I have flesh and I have a spirit. Well, sometimes in these instances, my flesh begins to come to the fore and rise up. And the result of that is I, I start becoming angry and frustrated. And then I continue to spiral down because the longer I stand in that line, the longer I have to wait, these feelings just escalate. They don't dissipate. The fire within me burns hotter and hotter. And so even after I'm able to go through the checkout line and, and pay for my items and leave the store, my mood, my mood is shot because it's been set by that event. And so the way I treat people after I leave that place, my anger travels with me, just looking for opportunities to erupt and to be released. That's what happened here in this ice cream story. People just couldn't control their anger. So they reacted. And, and there's many other. We, we read stories every day or listen to newscasts where, where people just react from their frustration because they're angry and they're, they don't want to wait. They want everything now. And so road rage is on the, on the rise. We hear about it all the time. Maybe we've experienced it, but we hear about it all the time. A violence and, and uh, people being murdered. I mean, just about every week they tell us how many uh, 
shots were fired in Chicago and how many people died as a result of it. And the numbers are alarming. And why is that going on? Because people are frustrated. They're angry. They don't like being pent up and, and pushed around and inconvenienced. But I want to say to you and to me that as a Christian, as a Christian, hear me now, as a Christian, the way that we respond, the way that you respond, the way that I respond is very revealing. Think about it. Several months ago in one of my sermons, I, I used an illustration uh, of a sponge. Let's say you walk into the kitchen and sitting on the drain board is a sponge. Is it dry or is it wet? You can't tell by looking at it. So what do you do? You push on it. You apply pressure. And when you do, water begins to ooze out of it. You see, that's a perfect illustration of what pressures do to us. We may not know that that anger, that sense of entitlement, those uh, being prone to, to react, we don't know that a lot of that is still within us until we're placed under pressure. And when we're placed under pressure, you and I as Christians, the people need to see Jesus. They need to see Jesus respond through us and not anger and frustration and violence, violent acts. And so let's talk about how we can do that. It's really not that hard. Here's the good news. Rather than react, we can respond. And our response can be very different because it's not born of our flesh, but it will be born of our spirit. Now, now follow me with this. We all know that patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit according to Galatians 5.22. And because it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, it is not something that manifests itself when I'm reacting in my flesh. So what do I have to do? Well, Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Don't be impatient. Wait for the Lord, and he will come and save you. So what I've got to do when I begin to react is I've got to get the Holy Spirit involved. When the Bible says, wait on the Lord, it's saying, look to Him, look to God with some expectation. That word wait actually means to, to look with expectation of receiving. It's not just looking around. So I wait on the Lord. What do I do waiting on the Lord? So I'm there at Walmart and I'm the fifth person back and I, I, I feel myself starting to get frustrated. Well, what do I do? I, be, I began to think of my favorite worship song. And I just began to silently or maybe quietly, if I'm a little bolder than that, I just begin to sing my worship song, looking to Jesus, worshiping the Lord, putting my eyes on him. And after a while of doing that, the Spirit just takes over. The Prince of Peace just rallies to my immediate circumstance and imparts his peace to me. And I'm able to stand there and wait for those four or five people that are before me to finish checking out and be kind to the cashier and not leave with an attitude except an attitude of worship. An attitude of worship because now I'm living under the leadership of the Holy Spirit because I chose to invite the Holy Spirit into my situation. And I did that by worship. God inhabits the praises of these people. So I'm worshiping him. God comes down. He's right there with me and he's imparting peace to me. So I focus on Jesus 
and not the circumstances that are before me. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, I love this. It says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, catch this, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. It says, God will keep you in perfect peace. That is shalom, shalom. And when it's a double like that, it means an unbelievable, uh, supernatural peace. He'll keep you in that kind of a peace when your thoughts are fixed on him. And here's the beautiful part. It's not me doing the work. I'm not doing the work. It's God. It's God who's coming down and giving me the peace. He's the one that's doing the work. What I'm doing is I'm denying my flesh, and I'm letting God be God through me instead of being like so many other people. You behave like that, and people see Jesus. They'll see the Prince of Peace arrive in your situation, whatever it may be. I want to remind you of this, that that God loves you. God loves you, and he's always at work to make you better. You say, well, even in this checkout line? Well, yeah, even in the checkout line at Walmart, you know, Romans 8, 28, all things work together. Well, how can this work together for good? I'm standing in this line. Well, it will will work together for good if you will do what I say. If you will exercise patience and begin to get your eyes off that situation and begin to focus on Jesus, begin to praise and worship him, that spiritual fruit, And keep in mind, it's a spiritual fruit. It will grow within you at that moment. It will manifest itself. But it's like a muscle. It has to be tested. We we know what the Bible says about tests. Tests work to our good because it exercises us in righteousness. And if you want to be a a patient person, then ask God to make you a person patient person but I always warn people be prepared because he's going to put you to the test because that's the only way that he can develop patience in you is by working that muscle and developing that spiritual gift that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit here's the problem with that though I'll just tell you be honest with you humans don't like to exercise I don't like to exercise I need to, and I do, but it's not because I want to. It's because I need to. And it's not even because I have to, because no one makes me. Once again, it's because I need to, and so I make myself. But once again, we don't like to wait either. Humans just don't like to wait, especially Western civilized people and even Christians. We want faster internet. We want faster service. We want faster cell phones. I got a four, but man, I got to get me that 5G phone that just came out. We're always wanting something faster. And that's a part of uh, how we've become accustomed living here in America. We don't like to wait. But let me share some scriptures with you, okay? And just hear me out. Just kind of quiet your heart right now and listen to these verses, okay? Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Psalm 37, 7. I wait for the Lord, and in his word do I hope. Psalm 130, verse 5. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee. Psalm 37, verse 34. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Psalm 40. And then there's just many, many, many more. I encourage you to 
take your Bible, your computer software, your concordance, whatever tool you have, and, and look up at that word, wait. In the Hebrew, that word is the word, kalwavah, and it means to wait with an expectation. It's not just hanging, hanging around, twiddling your thumbs. It, it's focusing on the Lord and expecting Him, expecting Him to be right there, right now, and he promises, if you seek me, you'll find me. You call on me, and I will respond to you. So what's the bottom line here? Well, the bottom line is, if I will wait, I will become better. If I discipline myself and learn to wait on God in obedience to Scripture and under the leadership of God's Spirit, knowing that God is right there with me while I'm waiting, and I'm waiting with expectation. If I can program myself to do that, I will become a much better person. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, you all know these verses. It says, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When does your endurance grow? When your faith is tested. You see, so as we go through life, as we go through daily life on planet Earth, there's going to be good days and bad days. Good days and bad days. But you know what determines what kind of a day it is? You. It's your responses to the things that happen in that day that either determine whether it's a good day or a bad day. The fact of the matter is, it's all up to you and up to me. Will you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge before you today that being forced to wait at any time is difficult. But in the ongoing days of this pandemic, Lord, it is truly, truly, truly hard. But Father, we know that you haven't abandoned us we know that your word says that you're working for good even during this time. And so we're going to accept that. We're going to believe your word. And we're going to hope for something that's better within us and something that's better for us to experience on the other side of this. Lord, thank you that when we tend to be impatient, we can call on you. We can lift our spirit. The, the, the psalmist says, why are you cast down, my soul? He says it twice. Why are you cast down, O oh, my soul? Hope in God. So when we feel ourselves starting to succumb to impatience, Lord, let's lift our hearts and hope in you and Begin to worship and praise you in a way that your glory comes down and your Holy Spirit wells up within us and we find supernatural peace as we keep our minds focused on you. Thank you for this word. Thank you for your goodness towards us. Thank you for your provision even during these very difficult times you are meeting our needs. And we realize that all good things come down from you. And we thank you for them. And Father, just in closing, I, I pray for these pastors and churches that are going to open uh, in defiance to the governor. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would shield them, that you would cover them with your glory in such a way that they would be protected, not only from evil, but from sickness, and that, Lord, they would be able to worship you 
worship you in freedom and truly enjoy communion with you without consequences that are negative. So, Lord, we pray for them as we close. We thank you for this day and for all that you do for us, Lord, and we give you the praise and glory that you are due. In Jesus' name, amen.